Hello, and welcome to PDUsToGo.com. My name is Jennifer Witt, a PMI Certified Project Management Professional, Certified Professional Coach, and PMI Global Registered Education Provider, helping project managers meet their PDU requirements. PDUs to Go is the portable and affordable market leader for professional development unit credits towards project management professional certification renewal as accredited by the Project Management Institute. This site has truly become the iTunes for project management and allows students to gain access to world-class project management-centric authors. It provides credible and applicable downloadable content toward PMI-accredited project management training and development. As a founder of pdus gocom and the president of Optimo Incorporated, a PMI Global Registered Education Provider, I have been honored to lead, teach, manage, and consult with project managers on a variety of complex management issues. With over 20 years of experience leading complex projects, working with budgets ranging from 50000 to $500 million, it has been my personal experience that it's not the process, tools, or techniques that mostly lead to projects failing, but more so people and soft skills needed for success. With budget shortfalls, untimely deliverables, and resource constraints, most companies experience an 80% failure rate with projects being on time and within budget. Our experience recovering trouble projects has taught us it's the soft skills that are missing when their projects begin to derail. At pdus gocom our primary focus is on teaching soft skills needed to manage and deliver projects on time and within budget. This self-paced audio course, once completed, will allow you to register online with PMI and receive your PDU credits to meet your requirements. Our customers have branded pdus to go as the iTunes for project managers, and our students tell us all the time they love the portable and affordable way they earn PDUs while on the go. Hello, this is Jennifer Bridges with pdus to gocom I want to welcome you today for our webinar on Lead Like a Boss, Leadership Skills for Leading on the Edge. And today, I'm very excited to have with us our guest, Brian Heathman. Brian, welcome. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Well, Brian, um, I know we've been working together for a little while. Why don't you tell the uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm the uh, CEO of Made for Success. We're a publishing company based in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And we work primarily with professional speakers getting their books published into various markets. So I consider myself one of the uh, luckiest folks out there because on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm working with new thought leaders and helping them get their uh, ideas out into the marketplace. And um, Lead Like a Boss, the book that we're talking about today, is no exception. Well. I'm looking forward to this. Um, we re recently were able to uh, launch a course based on this, and one of the purposes today for this specific webinar is really to give the audience an idea of the concepts and principles in the book and in the course and some of the authors that we have uh, who have contributed to this. So can you tell us a little bit more about the book, Lead Like a Boss? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. When we were uh, putting together the plans for Lead Like a Boss, we were taking a look at all kinds of different ideas of ways to present this leadership information from the 15 co-authors from this book. And we decided to um, give this book kind of, a, kind of a different spin than you read in a lot of leadership books that are out on the market. We wanted to um, have, a, have a little bit of an edge, have a little fun with it, um, bring in some fairly famous and uh, highly respected authors to contribute who have some really interesting stories. So one of those stories is from um, a guy named Tom Ziegler. Now Tom is the CEO of Ziegler Incorporated and he's the, um, uh, the son of Zig Ziegler and he wrote a fascinating chapter on leadership vampires in the workplace. So that just kind of sets the tone for what type of leadership book this is. We've got 
another uh, gentleman who's a uh, politician and a business owner who was actually in Columbine High School in Colorado when the shooting went down back in the late 90s. And he, his leadership philosophies were completely shaped by being in that room at that time, noticing how students responded, noticing how the school administrators responded, and how um, other folks that were in the room. So it's a fascinating thing. So Lead Like a Boss is primarily organized into five parts. Um, part one is about leadership in your career. Um, part two is on leadership mastery. Part three is managing radical change in the workplace, which is uh, rampant um, in today's world. Four is, part four is looking at leadership dyna or personality dynamics. So how to deal with difficult personalities that you might encounter in the workplace. And finally, we went out to several uh, PhDs and CEOs and we took a look at some productivity strategies about how to do your job better. Um, so that's the way the, the book has been organized. Again, it's full of stories and interesting anecdotes from some very interesting people um, and uh, makes for a very fun read. Well, for sure, what I like about this is for sure the areas that are going to be covered and the tips and techniques uh, brought forth in the book and the course are definitely things that project managers can relate to. Great. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, as we get going here, I'd like to, uh, I've got about, uh, I don't know, four or five guest authors lined up on this call. Um, and uh, I think uh, we ought to go ahead and kick off and hear what some folks have to say. Mm -hmm. Rain right. Hickey with Made for Success. Today we have Kevin Parker on the line, who is a co-author of Lead Like a Boss. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Kevin, uh, just to get started, can you give us a little background um, on yourself as a leader? You bet. My first um, opportunity uh, leadership position was when I was 22 years old, when I was an area director for an organization called Young Life. I was the youngest area director in the country. Um, it was working through Young Life where I had an experience at Columbine High School. I was visiting a student for lunch and inside the cafeteria the morning the shooting began. That was when I first started um, to say I need to take leadership very seriously. I saw a lot going on that day. I, my wife and I also own Dutch Bros Coffee in Spokane where we have more than 50 employees in several locations. I'm also a member of the Washington State Legislature. I teach leadership at Whitworth University and I'm the leadership instructor for Fairchild Air Force Base. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you, Kevin, um, you have one of the more interesting stories I have heard in recent memory. Um, can you uh, can you share with us a little bit about your experience at Columbine High School? You bet. So on the morning of April 20th, I was meeting the student for lunch. Um, and when that student did not show, I made my way down to the cafeteria. And right when I got down to the cafeteria, that's when the shooting began. And then after the shooting, so I was there inside Columbine during the shooting. And then in the aftermath, my wife's and I condo was the place where a lot of Columbine students congregated. So we, we were deeply involved in that community, deeply involved with Columbine students where we walked very closely with them there's something significant about looking at a tragedy in the eye and that will question and ask and and propel you to ask questions on what does leadership look like do i exercise leadership effectively those kinds of questions uh, there's also powerful stories inside columbine of students helping students in one case which i write about a student helping another student out of the library and literally carrying them outside the school so columbine there it is a tragedy but there are amazing stories of hope of leadership and selfless acts of immense kindness within the halls of the um, school. Very interesting. So um, one of the things that, uh, that I found interesting were some of your stories of success and also some stories of leadership failure uh, during that experience. Can you tell us, uh, can you help contrast that through your firsthand account of what you saw? What was really interesting is there's a, there's a theory out there called cognitive reflection, which means when the red light in the cockpit goes off, do you know what to do? And no one can predict a tragedy when or where it's going to happen. And, but we all have little tragedies in our lives, little and big. The question is, when that red light goes off, do we know, what, do we know how to respond? And inside Columbine, there were stories of um, students who were very frustrated with some of the staff because as everyone was running around, the smoke alarms or the fire alarms are, are going off. It's incredibly loud. There's chaos. Students are running everywhere. There were students where 
staff would tell them, hey, don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. And perhaps in the midst of being carried away by the wave of students running out, that those staff members never came back and students were left in classrooms. And some of, some of them were very frustrated. And obviously, they were very scared. And that's when I first started to think about the issue of leadership and to take it seriously, is when that red light goes off, what we have prepared for and what we have read will become amazingly relevant. Now, likewise, on the other side of the story, there are amazing stories of teachers who literally saved students' lives, of Columbine students who've saved other Columbine students, the principal who did an amazing job in compassion and servanthood, working with the community and working with the Columbine faculty, staff, students, and larger community to, to move the school forward after such a dramatic shooting. So to answer your question, there are a lot of leadership failure stories. There's some in my own personal life as well. There's also a lot of leadership success stories, both of which we can draw upon. So I imagine that having gone through a, uh, a life or death type situation where that, quote, red light in the cockpit goes off, um, that would shape a lot of thinking about leadership. And one of the things that you write about in your chapter in Lead Like a Boss is the concept of adaptive leadership. Now, I haven't seen a ton written on the subject to date. Um, can you share with us where that model came from? You bet. You're correct. There is not a lot written out of it. It came out from a professor of mine out of the Kennedy School back at Harvard University named Marty Linsky. His partner's Ron Heifetz. This is a theory that they've been using for the last really decade and a half, and they've been using it with some of the world's most prestigious organizations and individuals. It's, it's adaptive leadership. When I have used it, I have found where, whether I'm using it with bank executives, higher level um, individuals in positional leadership, or entry level, whether profit or nonprofit, that the theory of adaptive leadership has resonated at all levels of the workforce. Interesting. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. It was my honor. All right. Up next, we have Clara Chorley on the line. Clara Chorley is the CEO and founder of Clarity Unlimited, and she's got extensive and unique background as a career satisfaction expert and both business consultant and humanitarian. Clara is the author of the book, Turn, Four Steps to Clarity in Your Life and Career. Clara is an international speaker and a TEDx presenter, and currently lives in San Francisco, California. Clara, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brian. I'm excited to be here. So in reading your chapter in Lead Like a Boss, I noticed that you were writing about, uh, uh, about how we need to change our beliefs, habits, and behaviors, and why that matters when it becomes uh, being an effective manager. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. And let me d redefine what the word manager means in this context. So you might be somebody who is literally managing other people, or you might be a contractor working with other contractors. Either way, if you're in business, if you're a professional, you're managing people. You're managing relationships. And the level of effectiveness of those relationships really determines your level of success. When it comes to how we're doing professionally, I think a lot of people do understand the idea of habits and behaviors. I know if I've got some bad habits like not returning emails or putting off calls or avoiding people or not being able to be effectively confrontational, if I have some habits like that, I understand that those behaviors and habits might not be working for me. If I'm staying up really late at night and trying to come into work and be fresh the next day and be effective, I understand that. The beliefs might be a little bit more of an interesting area to explore. Because what I've noticed with a lot of people that I've worked with, and I've worked in all around the world, I've traveled and worked in a total of about 40 different countries, so many different backgrounds, there's these core beliefs that we all carry inside of us. And if I, on some level, don't believe that I can get to where I want to get to professionally, then that's going to stop me and hinder me along the way. It'll have me holding back where I should be stepping forward and taking a risk. So it's so vital for us to look at what do I believe, not only about what I'm capable of, but about the organization that I work for. Do I believe in its mission and its vision? Can I get on board with this? Can I bring my best work here? And when we are living our best and living what's true for us, we are so much better with other people. We're calmer. We're more effective. We communicate in a different way. We're able to reach out and extend ourselves more. We put ourselves on the line a little bit more. 
which means that other people tend to trust us more. So that's why it's so vital that we look at these beliefs and the habits and behaviors that we know we should be changing. And that can really change and effectively change how we work with others. Great. Now, when I was reading your chapter, I noticed that you made a connection between unwinding and decision making. It sounds kind of uh, counterintuitive. Can you tell me about that? Absolutely. The, there's actually been a lot of studies done on the brain. And we live, as you know, Brian, we live in a very fast-paced world right now. And unfortunately, I think it's getting a little bit faster, and very few of us, we all know we should be out there, you know, hugging trees and walking by the ocean and slowing down. But we don't really do it. And oftentimes, people don't really understand what the true value of that is. Studies have been shown that the brain actually gets tired. Let's say you've had a really good night's sleep and you wake up and you're rested. And part of the reason you're rested is your body's rested and your brain is rested. And you start making decisions, little things like, should I get out of bed now? Should I take a shower? What time do I need to leave to get to work? What should I eat for breakfast? As you start making all of these decisions, and maybe you're also thinking about some of the things in your work that you've got to address later that day. Or some of you wake up and pick up your Crackberry and start making those decisions right away. As you start making these decisions, it's been shown that the brain patterns actually change. So what happens is when our brains are rested and refreshed, we have the capacity to really look at the look at problems holistically. It means here's a problem, here's an issue, here's something I have to make a decision about. Even if let's take something really as simple as should I have lunch right now? Here's something that I have to make a decision about because maybe I've got a huge workload going on. If I'm rested and my brain is rested, I'm going to be able to think about the long-term implications of not having lunch right now. If my brain is not rested, I'm going to make a short-term, quick fix decision. And you can imagine how this impacts when you've got important professional decisions to make, whether it's answering an email, whether it's how to approach somebody, whether it's how patient you're feeling. So as the brain gets tired and tired, maybe we don't take that lunch break. We don't take an hour out and stop. Maybe instead we grab a donut. So we've let ourselves down, not only on the health front, but also in terms of really how effective we can be for the rest of the day. Judges who were up in court have been shown that when their days get further on, few and few prisoners that come up for probation actually get allowed probation because they don't trust themselves with the decisions that they're making. Unwinding, pausing, slowing down, stopping, doing something like meditation, being in the moment, surfing, biking, walking, being out in nature is a powerful way to refresh your brain. And that's one really good reason. Because when the brain is refreshed, we make better decisions, we're more resourceful, and we're way more creative. Interesting. So one of the things that I saw was an exercise in the transform section of your writing. Um, how can we use that with other employees or vendors or other contractors that we come in contact with in the workplace? Well, one of the things that I've tried to be really clear about in this chapter is it's very much about changing yourself. So there's a big focus on how do you make you better? Now, oftentimes we know how to climb the corporate ladder. We know the steps we've got to take, the classes we need to take, the PDUs we need to gather, for example, if you're a project manager. We know some of the the, 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 the specific tangible steps that we need to take. But what my chapter really focuses on is what's going on inside of us. So when you get to transform, and I'm not going to ruin it by saying what the exercise is, but when people get to the transform um, exercise, it's a really interesting way of starting to identify, oh, different parts of me want to do different things. Part of me does want to confront my manager. Part of me wants to hold back. Part of me wants to go take a course and learn how to have these kind of effective conversations. And how these different parts of us show up in all areas of our life, honestly, but it's very useful in terms of professionalism. When you can start to identify the different parts the different parts of yourself, the ways you're get pu getting pulled in multiple directions, you can start to recognize it in the person who's standing in front of you. So maybe one of your colleagues comes to you and they've got a problem or they're upset about something. As you're listening to them, and we all know the power of active listening, active and um, empathic listening in our lives, 
as you're listening to this person, you're going to start to hear, oh, they've got this, part of them wants to do that, part of them wants to do that. You'll listen in a whole new way. And just by naming those different conflicts that you're hearing that that person is having, it's going to change the way that you two work together because they're going to feel more understood. And when they feel more understood, again, their trust for you goes up. And when trust is high, as we know with Patrick Lencioni's work, if you've looked at the five dysfunctions of team, when it comes into when, when you're in an organization, trust is absolutely foundational. When the trust is high between individuals in the organization, you've got a successful organization. It, there are other, obviously other more complicated pieces to that, but that's the foundation of it. So that transform exercise I am really excited about and um, I think really brings way more value um, than, than people might on the surface. You've actually got to get in and do the exercise. Don't just read it. Actually do it and I think you'll, you'll get some surprising realizations from it. Well, thank you, Claire, for joining us and your support in Lead Like a Boss. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right. Up next, we have Alan Coleman on the line, who's a co-author of Lead Like a Boss. So, Alan, I was reading uh, the book, and as I was reading through it, I noticed that you differentiate between being a leader and being an exceptional leader. Can you sum up a key ingredient that differentiates the two? Yes, Brian, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I think it's fair to say that no one is really a born leader. Uh, it's the kind of a thing where there are lots of people who are potential leaders. So with that potential, whether it's to play basketball or sing opera or even the potential to invent uh, barbecue chicken wings, it's something that has to be cultivated. And the key ingredient overall, whether somebody is leading a business development program or is a senior leader of a large organization, They've got to have a mindset with two key components. They have to recognize an opportunity, and they have to be able to close it. And maybe the, the best way to describe that is something that Richard, Sir Richard Branson has said repeatedly. And, you know, he started out with just a small little magazine, hmm. and his, his enterprises now own over 400 different organizations from representing the rock group Sex Pistols to Virgin Airlines, and, I, and I'm not sure there's a relationship between those two. <laughs> but but his, his, his comment that I've often heard is, don't worry if you miss the bus, another one will be coming along soon. So if you look for opportunities and you miss one, keep your eyes out for others. And I think that's an absolutely critical difference between um, a leader and an exceptional leader. Got it. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, so what, what do you consider the most vital skills for an exceptional leader? We, we have six laws of leadership that we, we emphasize, but I think there are a couple that are key, which I, I believe is your question. It's yeah. a combination of listening, actually making a decision, and then following up with the results. And, and let me take each one very briefly. Too often, management is so consensus-oriented or collegial-oriented that a, a leader is listening forever and rarely, if ever, making decisions. Mm. What you have to have is experienced, tested advisors. And you have to listen to them, but they also have to listen to you. Um, and let me give you a personal story. I was the head of a very large organization for several years, and our human resources director retired. And, mm -hmm. and people were very surprised at the person I appointed to replace Bill. And they kept asking why. And I said, for one primary reason, Bill and this gentleman both can say no. And it's a matter of not only having experienced, tested advisors, but having people who have the company's best interests at heart or the agency's best interests at heart and are willing to, to follow up with that. The second mm -hmm. key component, as I mentioned, is um, following, making the decision. And decision making, again, you go up to a certain point in getting advice, and then you make that decision. And, and we can come back to that in a minute. Um, and the last one, which I think is often the most missing of any regular leader, and that is the follow through, to make sure that what you direct or what your bosses say that they will help with gets done. Uh, a lot of clients will ultimately, when I'm working with them, call me not only a mentor, but a tormentor. Hmm. And I like the I like that tormentor role because what it means is they are becoming aware of the importance of not just 
making a decision or committing to do something, uh, mm. but uh, following it up. Huh. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, so if you're a guy like me who likes to get a book and follow the steps that are laid out in the book, and let's say that a leader like follows your leadership laws that you lay out in your chapter, they make a decision, but God forbid, let's say the decision fails or perhaps the brand new product doesn't sell or maybe even the, uh, the startup can't get funding. Um, what, what happens then? Well, that's a really good question, and it happens often. Um, I, I think to start with, a decision should never be a bet the company decision. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just completely out of line. Mm -hmm. uh, the decision should be measured, as I said earlier, after some very careful listening and challenging. Um, and if you decide not to do something, hopefully another opportunity will come along, and that's where the, the really great leaders are always looking for those opportunities. I, I think there's a really good contemporary example, and that's with BlackBerry. Hmm. As, as I think everybody knows, they made a conscious decision several years ago. It was a conscious decision not to build a new system. Yeah, sure. And they lost a tremendous amount of market share. But they didn't throw away the whole company with that decision. And fortunately, they made a new decision about a year and a half ago to design a new system that was an upgrade to their current one and come up with some new platforms. Right. And now they're back regaining market share. So there were two decisions that were really significant. Uh, one could have turned into a bet the company case, but fortunately, they got wise they recognize that they made a mistake, which answers part of your question, mm -hmm. and are back in business. I doubt if they'll regain the complete market share they had because the competition is pretty steep. Mm -hmm. But um, there, there's a, you know, I, as you can tell already, I uh, look for quotes to emphasize points. And in leadership, whether it's marketing leadership or business development or executive leadership, um, I used to love to watch Wayne Gretzky when he played, played hockey. And yeah. he had a great quote. You'll always miss 100% of the shots you do not take. So, hmm. yes, you may not get funding for something that you've decided to do, or uh, it fails, or it doesn't sell. But the bottom line is, if you've made a careful, conscious decision, hopefully uh, it's not a bet the company decision, and you find a way to rectify it if it doesn't work, or it's considered development money that uh, it may not be wasted because you can apply it to something else in the future. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So in reading your chapter, I pulled a quote that I kind of liked, uh, which was, whether they are leading a new business growth effort or building a new product, leaders are ultimately leading people. So that got me to thinking, are people an asset or are they a liability? <laughs> they're both. <laughs> and they're both at the same time. <laughs> um, Look, ultimately, it's people who do everything. They design a product or service, they test it, they build it, and who are they selling it to? People. Whether those people are in a company or on the street or in a supermarket or wherever they are, people are always involved, and they're involved every step of the way. Um, but when you're looking at leadership, which this is about, uh, we're talking about an exceptional leader. And there are plenty of people who can lead and will have some followers. Um, but a leader, an exception leader, really has a vision about where to go and the ability to get people to follow them. And that's one of the really key ingredients here. Um, an exceptional leader can, can take a, a journey and make it an adventure or a quest. And I'm not trying to be flowery here, but it's true. If, if we're going to take a company or an agency in a certain direction, by getting the people on board, by encouraging the, the, the I divide them up into leaders, bosses, and followers by, mm -hmm. by getting the bosses enthused who in turn can get their followers enthused. Uh, there's a much greater chance of, of having a success here. Um, this is, talking about people, I used to love to watch the New York Yankees. And mm -hmm. Casey Stengel, who was their classic old-time manager, used to throw words out all the time. And one of the things he said about managing uh, is this. A key to being a good leader is keeping the people who hate me away from those who are still undecided. 
<laughs> and, and, and good old Casey was, was in, a, in a way, telling it correctly. A, a, an exceptional leader, the head of an organization, can't know everybody. And you've got to make certain assumptions that people will need certain responses from the leader, certain directions that have to be followed in order to get the company in that new direction or to accomplish a new tactic or a new problem, deal with it, dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if people, if a leader can make people understand why it's better to be one place than another, then they're really falling into the exceptional category because they're not afraid to see new ground as, as uh, exciting and not something that overwhelms them. Mm. So I hope that answers that, that particular question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does, Alan. Thanks so much for calling in. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brian, very, very much. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Now, next on the call, we have Annette Brown. Now, Annette, most people listening on this call have already completed a business plan and are curious to see how this chapter might be able to help with their business. Brian, that's an excellent question. Um, and when I hear owners of businesses say, well, I've finished my strategic plan, uh, my visceral response is, well, it's probably not much of a plan if it's finished. Because creating a dynamic strategic action plan is going to bring your business forward in today's fast-paced environment. Business changes dynamically, always. And if you create a dynamic strategic action plan, that becomes an iterative process. It's based on that ever-changing external and internal environment, and with it, it's, it's constrained. So your business will go ahead and make strides towards completing major goals and goalettes with incremental steps and incremental development. What this process does is it evolves through collaboration with your team, adaptive planning. It allows your business to react to operational timing changes, funding changes, and market changes. The dynamic strategic action plan encourages flexible response to change. It's a framework that promotes reaction to and interaction with the, rea the realities of the business environment. Okay. That is quite interesting. I'd like to back you up a second. So I heard you, now I understand what a goal is, and I've set goals for my own business, but um, you mentioned goalettes a few seconds ago. Could you tell us about those? Well, goalettes break goals down into smaller manageable goals that for the major goals. Mm -hmm. So each of your major goals will likely have minor goals or goalettes that naturally support the major goal. And each goalette will answer one question that is quantifiable. Each goalette will have a natural cycle of completion that you'll be reviewing as a business owner. And to give you a couple of examples, they may answer questions such as, how many prospects did I contact today to add to my sales pipeline? Another goalette might be, how many people visited my website and took action, or possibly how many volunteers did our company train this year? Okay, okay, that makes complete sense. So now can you tell me what the main components are of a dynamic strategic action plan? Sure, Brian, there's three main components of a dynamic strategic action plan. It's focus on your mission, why do you do what you do? That's the number one, why, why are you in business? And then the second component is you set goals that focus only on the achievement of that mission. And then the third component of a dynamic strategic action plan are those goalettes. So you set goalettes that are easy to see, do, and achieve, and they further your goals. So you move your business forward using a very simple, dynamic, process of action planning. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I understand that you own your own business. Um, so can you tell us how this works in your business? Well, for 2013, I committed to reviewing my mission, goals, and goalettes once a week. So I hold myself and my team accountable 
for achieving those goals that further the mission. And this year, I've already earned more money in my business than I did in all of 2012, and I'm on track to exceed my goals by 50%, the financial goals. I'm pretty okay. excited about this dynamic strategic action planning in my own yeah. business. Yeah, I'm interested in layering this information into my business as well. Thanks for calling in, Annette. Thank you, Brian. Next, we have Matt Youngquist on the line. And uh, Matt has some really interesting things to say about leadership and career success. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Good to be here. Yeah. Hey, so can you um, give us a little um, input and tell us what you think leadership means from a career standpoint? I sure can. Um, yeah, I think leadership, um, you know, in terms of the book that's been put together here, I mean, a lot of people think about leadership strictly in a company context. But I, having been a career coach now for 20 years and worked with a very wide variety of people, I think it's really important as part of the overall mix of leadership for be, people to think about being a leader in their own career path and planning efforts. And I, I what I've really seen out there now is I think that um, – you know, the world really has changed, and now more than ever before, we are the captains of the ship. We're in charge of our own careers. Whatever illusion or historical, you know, sense there might have been before that companies would take care of that or take care of you cradle to grave, I think we've all seen that largely go away and that responsibility shift back to each one of us as professionals having to own that and say, you know, where is my career? Where am I taking it? How am I keeping it healthy? and to show some leadership in that regard. And uh, I certainly meet a lot of Americans and folks in the job market that I don't think have fully embraced that and might need to sort of spiff, spiff up their sense of what that means to be a leader of your own career. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. It sounds like you've got some really interesting experience, 20 years helping to coach uh, leadership success in the workplace. And when I was reading your chapter, you say that um, talent, is only half the battle. So I was curious, what's the other half? Well, yeah, that, that's a really interesting um, observation that I guess what keeps me so engaged and passionate in the work I do is, you know, I fell into this field, again, of career coaching 20 years ago. I didn't know it existed. But I keep looking back, Brian, and realizing that when I grew up, the only message I'd gotten about career success was get good grades and go to a good school. And uh, so I did those things. But when I got out in the real world, I found out very quickly that, there, that the world is, the job market is not a meritocracy. And, you know, all of those fancy scholastic accomplishments really were only, again, half the battle compared to knowing how to promote yourself, market yourself, network, and get exposure. So kind of the main message I'm trying to send in my chapter of Lead Like a Boss is that, you know, sure, it makes a lot of sense to um, get good education and make good choices about companies you go to and titles, but just like the corporate market, you know, it's not always the best product um, that wins the game. We have, you know, a whole society full of products that win because they have good or better marketing than their competition. And for better or worse, that's how the job market largely works as well. And I see so many people concentrate on building their resume, but doing next to nothing to promote themselves uh, or even just learn the, you know, how to go out and job hunt in a modern fashion today. Um, in fact, I would, I would humbly say I think most people I meet, if I assess their job hunting efforts, I'd probably give them a D minus. Mm. I, I, I don't judge that because if you don't do this for a living or you haven't needed to study that stuff, you've probably had a pass for 10 or 20 years. But more and more, I think people need to realize there are so many ways people can create that exposure for themselves, create opportunities, and that's at least half of the game. It's not just who's a slightly better accountant or a you know, slightly better salesperson than the, than the next guy or gal. A lot of it comes down to that self-promotion and the five competencies I talk about in the book. Okay, that's interesting. Well, now here's a, here's a kind of a funny question, but do you think that all professionals need to learn how to promote themselves or you know, just like certain types, like executives or consultants? You know, I, I think it's more widespread than you'd, you'd think. Um, you know, back in the day, maybe it was more just the elite of the elite or the people who wanted to be seen as thought leaders or consultants who had to generate business leads. But, I mean, I think you hit on the key word, which is professional. Um, you know, if someone is doing a day job, an hourly job, uh, 
you know, they're not to not to judge this as well, but if someone just, you know, works to pay the bills and is a waiter or waitress or works at Starbucks, you know, they probably don't need to get as wrapped up. But if you're talking anyone who considers themselves a professional um, from an entry level, you know, operations person up to a senior executive, I, I think, again, it's a competitive landscape. So, you know, I've used these same principles um, for just about every type of career under the sun at all levels, you know, nursing, administrative assistance on up to executives. So I think the key is if you're a professional, part of your professional competency has to know has to be knowing how to sell and market yourself and to look for a job effectively. If you don't really think of yourself as having a professional career or you're just not there yet, yeah, you may get a little bit more of a pass, but that's where I'd kind of draw the line. Well, that was interesting, Matt, and thank you for your time today. Next up, we have Rick Justice on the line. Rick Justice is the founder and managing partner of 360, a branded venture capital firm. He has an extensive and unique background as a leading business growth strategist, international speaker, entrepreneur, rainmaker, and adventurer. Beginning at age 11, Rick Justice has spent 25 years speaking on leadership to over 3,524 audiences in 36 countries a danger-filled endeavor that became his quest after getting lost deep in the Himalayas. Rick's greatest joy is spending time with his three precious children. They are his little angels on loan and his professors that teach him the invaluable lessons of life. Rick, we're glad you could join us on the call. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that introduction. Rick, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Well, that's a, it's a crazy story. I like stories. And since you mentioned him, I can use that as just a segue point. That was my humble quest to make it to the Olympics, which never happened. That was my dad, uh, his inspiration and leadership in my life. He had me running six miles every other day from age five, beating military records before I was 10. So long story short, led me to doing high altitude training in the Himalayas at the age of, I was barely 19. So I ended up getting lost for three weeks because I didn't have the patience to get a trekking permit. And I was lost in the Everest region and I have never been so scared in my life. Fascinating story. Uh, there's a thousand stories in one. But uh, I remember the day that I thought it was all over after three weeks, met a Nepalese guy dressed like a cowboy, thought I was hallucinating, and I'll never forget the story he told me as I was parting, that Rick, there was a young guy that wanted wisdom. He went in search of the wisest old man. Upon finding him, he went down to the sea with this old man. This old man was strong, held him underwater three or four times, and kept asking the question, what do you want? The young man would say, wisdom. And that final time, just the old guy was obviously quite strong, just held him under the water for the longest time and finally lifts him up out of the water and says, what do you want? The young man says, air. He says, until you want wisdom as much as you wanted air, you will never have it. For me, that's really the core of who I am, became my really the catalyst for my quest, not just to understand leadership, but to really understand uh, what I call legacy and legacy leadership and it drives me until this day so uh, that's definitely articulated in this chapter that I've written in this book. So Rick I really enjoyed reading your chapter on legacy in Lead Like a Boss. Can you tell us why legacy matters in the context of leadership? It's a great question. Well, research shows that without a sense of working to create a legacy, adults lose meaning in their life. And I'm thoroughly convinced that that life is about meaning. You know, Viktor Frankl survived the concentration camps. I'm able to listen to a guy like that. He said, meaning is found in three sources, love, work, and courage. So I think that when it comes to leadership, it's ultimately about results. And results happen 
you know, there's people, processes, and systems. People are the only true variable. And when you, you know, learn to help people perform better, when you truly know what drives or motivates people, then, you know, you succeed to that degree as a leader. And so for me, the secret to really becoming an effective leader, meaning you're able to extract effectiveness, greater performance from your team, is to understand meaning. So for me, legacy is that piece. And it had to be redefined. And I didn't used to care about legacy. And it was a client of mine that changed the game for me. And I explained that in the chapter as well. And so I began the humble quest of redefining it. So the way you'll re you know, read it uh, in this chapter, uh, that new articulation, that redefinition of legacy, for me personally, and for the many, many audiences and CEOs and, and uh, just world-class performers that I share this with, are just, they're blown away. And I see them making quantum leaps overnight um, just in, in every endeavor. So, Rick, as you were um, writing your chapter in Lead Like a Boss, you come across a concept that you call the legacy formula. Can you give us a rundown as to what that's all about? Yes, absolutely. So the legacy formula is my attempt at summarization, summarizing the compendium of wisdom, as I call it, that I've received by conducting well over 10,000 interviews with leaders all over the world at every level, and then just through my own experience. And so the legacy equation, simply put, is clarity, courage, and commitment. Clarity, for me, is, is having an unfettered view of your vision, which is what you want, why you want it, but it's also fed by an understanding of its purpose and value. Your purpose is really about your values. Your values are what are most important to you. And what is most important to you truly is uh, the seat and source of your desire. And then, of course, that last so there's what do you really want? Why do you want it? Why is this important to you? And then, why is this important to others? It's translating your values into value in the world, in the marketplace, uh, with, with your client. And so I have found in the clarity piece of this legacy formula, just amazing breakthroughs happen, greater levels of performance. If you as a leader want to tap into unbelievable performance in your team members, it's really painting this piece so clearly that they can't see anything else. You know, and there's that, that old formula, you know, and it's just about vivid, be, you know, to the degree that you are vivid, you know, it's not just about clarity and, and having a dream or having a clear picture. You know, it's, it's I times V equals R, which is, you know, it's, it's your imagination plus vivid equals your reality. I don't know if that means much or and to you, but the courage piece is just simply, you know, in the in the process, in the journey of moving towards what you want, what you really want, um, inevitably you're going to fall down a lot. It might be the wrong strategy. It might be, you know, just it might be the wrong project. It might be the wrong, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities there. We, we fail, but uh, it's standing up again and being willing to move forward. It's being willing to stop or let go of something that perhaps, you know, isn't in, in alignment with your values and or your integrity. The commitment piece is one that's fascinating to me. I simply just didn't understand it for the longest time. And I thought it was the Vince Lombardi idea of winners never quit. I'm convinced now that it is quitting the wrong stuff, sticking with the right stuff, having the guts to do one or the other. But these three components I break down in the book and in this chapter on legacy that I call the practice of great leaders. And I call it a practice because you want to practice to the degree that it becomes embodied competence, like tying a shoe, driving a car. And to that degree, when you have clarity, courage, and commitment, 
it will change the game. I call it a quantified 20-year quantum leap in your life, in your leadership, in your performance, in your level of success. And this is my personal formula as well. The darkest and lowest point in my life, I was able to use this very formula to make a comeback with a lot of help, and I live my life with crazy gratitude. So that's just a snippet of, you know, just kind of a glimpse of what I've shared in this chapter without giving much of it away. Well, Rick, thanks for taking the time today to give us an overview of what the legacy formula looks like. I know a lot of people will uh, have some interest in learning more about your adventures and some of the things that you offer. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, thanks for asking that. So, yeah, you can find me uh, at 360.com. That is the number three, the number six, I-X-T-Y. That's pronounced 360, so 360.com. Great. Well, this is Brian Heathman, president of Made for Success. We want to thank you for joining us on this uh, fascinating discovery on legacy with Rick Justice. Thanks again, Rick. You're welcome. Well, Jennifer, that was a pretty interesting discussion today from some of the guest authors in Lead Like a Boss. Wow, uh, there are some amazing, amazing stories in there. Um, listening to Rick talk about his adventures in the Himalayas and uh, the talk about le leadership uh, legacy um, really set me back. And I've heard that story many times. Well, it's for sure all of the authors have brought some interesting perspectives and things that we as project managers can utilize on the project. So that's why I wanted to take this time and really uh, present these authors, you and the authors, to the project managers, the audience, because it's just what's in this book and the course that you have worked with us on to customize for our audience is um, pretty amazing. So for the people on the call, I appreciate your time today, and I hope this gives you a few more insights on this course, this book, and these authors, and some of the things that they, um, in their day-to-day -day lives, they go out in the world and that they're teaching. But I know there's some of you who just want to know, how do I get my PDUs? So we've got you covered on that. So there are three easy steps. First of all, and you've completed one of the three steps by listening to this webinar. So by listening to the webinar, you've actually completed the course. And from PMI, PMI requires, since this is a Category A PDU, that you complete the course completion form, which is online in your pds 2 gocom account. If you do not have a pds 2 gocom account, we actually create one for you using the email address that you use to register for this webinar. And we'll send out an email to that address upon post-production. So you fill out your course completion form, and then all you do is go to PMI.org and register your PDU using the activity number for this course. PDUs2Go.com is a global registered education provider with PMI. Be sure to explore more courses on our site, as many project managers consider us the iTunes for project managers. We look forward to helping you earn more PDUs through self-paced courses that allow you to learn and earn PDUs that's portable and affordable. Be sure to tell a colleague or friend to visit us at pdus2go.com. And thank you.